Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Ward. And I'm Chris's trusted sidekick, well, somewhat trusted sidekick, Steve Casely. And together, we are going to give you an exam tip on cost-benefit analysis that's going to help you when you're getting ready for any one of the project management exams that relate to the Project Management Professional, or PMP, and the CAPM, which is the Certified Associate of Project Management. If you're one of those that is preparing for either the PMP or the CAPM, here's the quick exam tips that we have for you on cost-benefit analysis. First off, cost benefit analysis. You're going to see this in a couple of different forms, but remember if you just think about it logically, cost, the amount of money we spend, benefit, which can of course be not only financial, it could be results or deliverables that we get because we did spend the money. And then we take some time to analyze and saying, are we getting the best for the money or the investment that we are putting into? So how does that all work? Well, there's some terms we need to know. Sunk costs, payback period, return on investment or ROI, benefit cost ratio, constrained optimization, net present value, and IRR. So let's get started. The first thing to think about when it comes to cost-benefit analysis is primarily what they're going to be asking you about is dealing with this, project selection methods. You will also see it a little bit in earn value. Now let's take a look at some of these, at these terms so that way you can recognize them. Some of these are just accounting terms, especially something like sunk costs. Sunk costs is any money that you, or resources, that you have placed into the project already. Now according to PMI, you do not consider sunk costs whether your project is successful or is on a successful track or not because it's money that's already been spent. Now that's a very oversimplification, but that's primarily what they might ask you about in that particular case. Now constrained optimization. There is a key phrase that you see in each one of these forms of constrained optimization. If you haven't figured it out yet, I've circled it right here, programming. If you are being asked about a way that deals with linear programming, nonlinear programming, what they're talking about is constrained optimization. Or as a good friend of mine, Vicky Rona says, fancy math. It's a way for you to decide whether this project will benefit you based upon the costs that you put into it. And again, it utilizes really cool programming or certain types of uh, math optimizations. The next one down here is ROI, return on investment. Return on investment is a, I would say, a catchphrase that everyone uses for if I've invested, what kind of return will I get on it? The one thing about ROI is that it does not consider the time value of money. Time plus money, of course, can change the actual value. So ROI does not really consider the time value of money. Instead, it just says you spent this much, you get this much in return. The last two I'm going to take a look at and then hand you over to Steve is payback period and benefit cost ratio. The payback period is basically, again, not taking into consideration the time value of money or interest and things like that. Instead, it says if I give $500 into a project, how long will it take for me to get my result? So basically, you want to look at a calendar. So this is a calendar right here. And you want to say, all right, well, if I give the $500 on this day, how long will it take for me to get my money back? Payback period. In the sense of an exam environment, if you are investing into a project or putting into a project, utilizing payback period, you want the shortest amount of time that you will get that money back so then you can use it for another project. Benefit cost ratio has been around since, well, I don't know, I want to say the dinosaurs, but I don't think they were doing project management. But instead, benefit cost ratio is a simple form formula. It is benefit divided by cost. So basically, if you have $2,400 in benefit and you divide it by $1,200 of cost, you would have 2.0 or 200% return on your costs. So that is pretty much the only thing that you would need to know here is that's how the formula works. And guess what? Obviously, anything less than one, so if we switch that, if I have $1,200 as a benefit and $2,400 as my cost, that would give me 8.5. You want to remember, less than one is not so good. More than one is obviously a lot better. 
Now you'll notice that out of all these things, none of them take into consideration the time value of money or basic interest and things like that. Steve's going to show you though too that you're going to want to use in PMP and CAPM or just in general project management that are much better at tracking the time value of money. Thanks, Chris, and I'll wrap this up with the discussion of net present value and internal rate of return. As you mentioned, these two cost-benefit analysis techniques extend the calculations, the discussions that you've had to date, and it brings in the fact that the purchasing value of the dollar changes over time. And as a case in point, a dollar in my youth bought me a lot more than a dollar is buying me today. To show you, show you how old I really am, uh, a soda and a bag of chips back then cost me 15 cents. 10 cents for the soda and 5 cents for the bag of chips. Today, depending on where you buy it, could be in the 350 range, could be a little higher, could be a little lower, but there's a substantial difference in the purchasing value of that dollar. But besides that fascinating trip down memory lane, where what's the relevance for cost-benefit analysis? The fact is the dollars we're investing in our projects today are worth more than the dollars that the projects are going to return when they actually begin to deliver value back to the organization. And that's why we need to consider the net present value as part of our cost-benefit analysis. And why is this? Because interest and inflation is changing that purchasing power of our corporate dollars and may help make the purchasing decisions for projects easier and more relevant. Where net present value helps us determine today's value of that future income from our projects, i.e., what is $5,000 returned from our project, but not going to happen from five years worth today? And we have this fascinating formula that's going to do the net present value for us. It's the sum of all of those cash flows, so all of the cash flows, divided by 1 plus the interest rate, all raised to the value of time. Fairly complex formula, math far more complex than you're going to be expected to produce by hand or with the rudimentary calculator that you're going to have during your exam. So understand that the formula exists and then forget about it. The real consideration that you need to have in hand for the exam is that the net present value of that future flow of dollars from our project, $5,000 in five years, is going to be discounted and today is only worth $3,500. So how does that make help us make our cost benefit decision? Am I better off investing the money in the bank and collecting interest? i.e. if it's going to cost me more than $3,500, let's put the money in the bank, let's collect interest, and at the end of five years, our organization is going to be better off. And our other analysis method is the internal rate of return. And if you think that net present value formula was complex, the IRR formula is even more intense. I'm not even going to share it with you. The point of IRR is it helps determine which projects makes more sense. It determines the point where the revenues equals the expenses and the goal is to select the projects with the highest IRR. We want to select the projects that have the highest IRR based on our anticipated interest rates. So therefore, again, if we have the choice between two projects, one has a 10% IRR, the other has a 15% IRR, we pick the one with the highest IRR. So there you have it, Chris, a bit of a whirlwind tour, but it takes the cost-benefit analysis, extends it over time, brings in the consideration for interest and inflation, net present value helps us make the determination whether or not the project even makes fiscal sense, or literally whether we're better off investing the money in the bank and collecting interest, and the IRR is used to determine which projects will make the most sense. So we use net present value to determine if the project makes sense, and then we use IRR to select the most viable when we have multiple projects that we need to select from. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. As usual, we hope this has been informative and we'd like to thank you for joining us.